Uh, okay, everybody, let's kick off. I really appreciate to see you all here. Well, I understand everybody else has gone to the pubs already. So that means we have the most devoted, motivated, interested and enthusiastic individuals here. Those who understand the importance of workload security in the Zero Trust epoch. Um, so we will discuss one particular problem, how we solved it and what challenges we faced and how we addressed them. Uh, introductions. So Backbase is a company that offers a, like a huge banking solution for, that covers all the aspects of modern banking in a digital transformation era, like personal banking, uh, like private banking, business banking, lending, digital assistance and stuff. And not surprisingly, uh, our software stack also has an identity component. And also, yeah, we have many customers and we have many developers and development and centers all around the world. And not surprisingly, I am working at the identity department as our resident key clock, our open source identity management and internet standards expert. I'm also an uh, independent uh, key clock consultant and expert, contributor to the project, member of the special interest group. And also I have contributed to a few uh, internet standards, both published and upcoming. Depop being probably most interesting among them. And without further ado, the problem. Is there a problem here? Not yet. So just a very standard situation where an external call passes through the uh, API gateway and results in a chain of uh, invocations uh, between the workloads. Now, what if we add authentication uh, on top of that? Uh, this will mean that normally the end user will first go to uh, like authorization server, authenticate, authorize there, uh, will get back something um, called a credential, maybe an OAuth access token, and then we'll pass that token in a call to the API gateway where it will be validated. And that again, uh, so in this situation, the chain of calls between uh, workloads uh, it occurs, um, after authenticated external call. Now, in the zero trust world, we want this chain of authentications only to occur as a result of external authenticated call. Uh, in, other world, uh, in other words, we would like to rule out uh, the spurious invocations between the workloads, uh, spurious or unsolicited or, or unauthorized. Uh, for example, we would not want like a malicious a workload to, to connect its, its neighbor without proper authorization. Uh, at the same moment, we would like to keep the legitimate calls between the workloads, a, also known as service-to-service -service calls. Already a little bit complicated, right? So there is a naive approach, I would say, called access token propagation. When the external access token is passed through the API gateway and then verified by the services. Just out of curiosity, who is using this approach? Uh, bad news for you, it doesn't work. <laughs> well, joking, it might work perfectly in your case, in your particular case, but generally it has a lot of problems. The problems start with the issue. So if we are building an uh, interoperable system and we want to support a number of external issues, like a cloud-based Okta, for example, a, a commercial like Team, and we want to make the switch between those issues as easy as possible. So imagine in this situation, all your services need to like, support multiple issues. Uh, and what if, for example, one of the issues is uh, SAML based? Yeah? So in this case, you will need not only to, to be able to validate OAuth or OIDC tokens, but SAML assertions. It, it's going to be a nightmare, okay? So in our company, we have a joke that there exist uh, four letter acronyms that give us shivers and keep us awake at night. One of them being SAML, uh, the second one being CORS, C O R S. Uh, okay, the next problem is topology and connectivity. Uh, validating an external access token does require some sort of connectivity between the verifier and the issuer. So, if it is an opaque token, for example, you will need to do an introspection call. Uh, if it is a signed token, you will need a key set, like a public key from the issue. Okay, you can grab the key set and cache it, but uh, those key set 
could be frequently rotated. It's like a good practice. So it like adds another layer of complexity. And finally, the problem is in the external token. Yes, it is very powerful and long lived. So if it's exfiltrated by a like malicious actor, it can be used to do some naughty, nasty things. Um, on the other hand, it is short lived. Yeah, it's like sounds like a paradox. The access tokens do expire. So what happens if your token expires mid transaction? So such a transaction will fail. For example, service A, the call to service A will succeed and call to service B will fail, resulting in a failed transaction overall. The external tokens, as I mentioned, they might be opaque, might contain no data at all. And they normally lack the request specific data, like for example, the IP address of the caller, something that we might need internally to authorize that call. So in sufficient context, um, and yeah, as I mentioned, if the, if the token is opaque, you will need to contact the issue to, in order to introspect it. And finally, it doesn't in any way, shape or form solve the problem of service to service calls. Now, there is a better solution. It is called transaction tokens. So it introduces a new service that is called transaction token service that is deployed like at the boundary. So it has connectivity to both the ECR and uh, and the internal workloads. So the workflow, uh, workflow is the following. The API gateway will e obtain, uh, sorry, receive the external um, token, contact the transaction token service to exchange this token for something that would be understood internally in the workload boundary, and then use it to, to initiate a call chain, passing, passing this uh, a new uh, token downstream. This, this is called transaction token, this new new concept. Uh, so I believe from maybe many of you have done the same in an ad hoc way. Our company did the same, I, I didn't tell you that. Uh, and finally, there is a way to do it like based on standards. Uh, there is an upcoming standards that's currently being discussed at the OAuth working group at IETF uh, called transaction tokens. It has been adopted by the working group. So it's now an internet draft. That means that eventually it will become an RFC. Maybe in a year, maybe in two. I, hopefully, yeah, that happens like uh, sooner than later. Uh, this document defines transaction tokens, the protocol, how to obtain them and how to use them. Okay, the token will be understood only internally. Uh, what's important, it's of one-time use, so it should be enforced by the workloads. Uh, it will contain, it, it might contain the request specific like contextual data, like IP address mentioned before. Uh, yeah, it can be down, down scoped, so it, it will be less powerful, way less powerful than the external access token. Uh, it can, can employ some fine grain or authorization and most importantly, it's built on top of standards, of existing standards, like OAuth token exchange, it's like a sub-protocol of OAuth, and JSON web token, which is a format. So let's take a look inside the, uh, the transaction token. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, it's uh, the base protocol for transaction tokens is OAuth. Uh, the trans transaction tokens cannot be opaque, so it's a requirement that they should be structured and signed. So it's a JOT, it's a signed JOT. So in bold, there are uh, claims, new claims that are added by this upcoming specification. Uh, in, in normal form, there are just uh, standard JOT claims. The new one is request context uh, that can uh, include information both on the external caller and the internal workload the purpose and authorization data. So there is not yet set in stone. So the, in particular, the last one is being currently discussed. So the, the document hasn't been finalized yet. So we can expect some changes here. So the last claim, the AZD, it defines uh, authorization, authorization data. Uh, now the protocol, uh, it defines three flows. So the most common one be, will be the basic flow, how to obtain the transaction token. Uh, it is intended to be used by API gateway. 
And so it is like a typical token exchange, but we define a new requested token type. So it is a <coughs> token exchange being a sub protocol of OAuth and transaction tokens are being uh, like a subset of or sub protocol of token exchange. Or in, in token exchange parlance, we call it profiles, like a spe specialization of token exchange. So there is a new requested token type. Uh, contextual data can be supplied at the last parameter request context. And uh, the server will respond with a, like a standard uh, OAuth response and, and provide a transaction token. The second flow is refreshing or replacing the transaction token. If, for example, an expired mid transaction or if the workload decides that it contains uh, insufficient uh, contextual data, it could request a replacement from the transaction token service. So here, both requested token type and subject token type will be the same. So we are exchanging one trans transaction token for another. And finally, what about service-to-service -service calls? Uh, in this case, uh, so for service-to-service -service calls, that would normally be like batch processes or scheduled processes that occur without any external notification. So in this case, we need to anyway supply something to, uh, to a transaction token server, and that will be a self-signed token that will be issued by uh, one of the workloads, then sent to the transaction token service. Uh, so it maybe it doesn't uh, entirely solve the problem of service to service calls, but it adds like another actor here in between. So the calls between the services will now be authorized because they will pass through the transaction token service. Okay. And uh, finally, how do we use no, those new tokens? Uh, you probably could have expected that uh, there would be uh, like authorization header and bearer something. So it was intentional, so uh, we have introduced a new uh, header for the same. Uh, because the, like, the purpose and the philosophy is, is dif different from the bearer tokens. And also an important moment that, in theory, those could be used in combination with like authorization bearer scheme. So uh, this new architecture, it sort of so uh, solves all the problems mentioned. Uh, in, in the beginning of this talk, uh, but of course there is a downside that for each, uh, so now for each uh, call you will need to contact a transaction token service to perform a token exchange. And this is why we have to pay extra attention to the deployment models, to scalability, uh, to performance and to the latency. Uh, so here I compiled a list or a tree of possible uh, deployment models, which are recognized by this spec. Obviously, so the very first options, uh, option, the cloud-based one, it's, an, it's a no-go. You, you cannot rely on Okta, for example, to implement a token service for you. So even if you like a file a request for a new feature, it might take a lot of time for them to implement it. And you definitely wouldn't want for each and every, uh, so, uh, for each and every call result in an extra uh, call to Okta. Yeah, so this is, this is an argo. Um, it is obvious that the transaction token service needs to be deployed as close to your workload as possible just to reduce latency. So probably the way to go is a uh, deployment on premises. This could be subdivided into like several options. You can embed it into API gateway, probably from the performance um, point of view, it will be the best option, okay? Uh, so there is like virtually no latency, no, no call between API gateway and like any, any other entity. But in this case, your API gateway will need to become a transaction token service because there will be replacement token calls and service-to-service uh, -service requests. So your API gateway will need to serve them as well. Uh, another option is to embed it into your authorization server. This will uh, work if you only support one authorization server, if you're not planning to support like several ones. And also it will work only if your authorization server will sustain the additional load generated by token transaction token requests. 
Um, finally, so I think the winner is a standalone deployment model. This is also could be subdivided into do you do you, do it yourself. I'm sorry, it should be DIY. Yeah, do it yourself. I will correct it. So uh, for this case, I would rank the Spring authorization server as the second. Uh, it's it's a really cool thing. It's uh, like it gives you um, a set of building blocks, which you can use to construct your authorization server or like a smaller concept transaction token service. Uh, but still, you will need to code a lot, because like building an OAuth server is a non-trivial thing. Um, for example, you will need to code things like authorization, uh, fine-grained authorization yourself. And when I started preparing this talk, uh, token exchange was not yet supported by Spring Authorization Server. It is supported now. So uh, this is, this is a definitely a good option. You can build a really lightweight transaction token service, but you will need to code a lot. Uh, the second one, commercial of the shelf, probably a loser here. So, um, uh, because commercial servers, they will be pretty heavyweight. You will need to scale them en masse. Uh, they will require a license, for an instance. Um, and, and finally, you will need to implement a new profile for token exchange. Yeah, so this depends on how extensible your commercial server would be. Uh, and finally, um, so after weighing different options, we have come up with Keyclock. Uh, it's a pure coincidence that we are experts in Keyclock and have been using it for years. Pure coincidence. So Keyclock is an open source, extensible, and lightweight. Uh, and we have expertise in it. <laughs> so those were all the contributing factors. So let me introduce Keyclock. Uh, it is an open source, single sign-on and identity management solution by uh, Red Hat. Uh, who is aware of Keyclock's existence and who? Okay, so guys, I need to uh, announce that tomorrow there is a KeyConf, the KeyConf conference. Probably it's, perhaps it's too late to register for on-site participation, but there will be a live stream, a free live stream. So feel free to watch. Um, okay, for the newcomers, Keyclock is an open source identity management and single sign-on solution backed by Red Hat. Uh, so I just copied this, this slide from the, um, from the website, uh, but uh, not for the purposes of like marketing or advertisement. Each and every, almost each and every concept listed on, on this slide is extensible. Uh, for example, protocols. Yeah, we have OpenID Connect OAuth and SAML out of the box. There is an implementation of CAS protocol for Keyclock as a plugin. Uh, brokering, like we can broker to the same OpenID or SAML external IDPs, we can broker to social services like Google, Facebook, Instagram and stuff. This is also extensible. You can deploy your plugin to implement a new method. Uh, let alone pass minor things like password policies and themes. Uh, even the subsets of the, for example, for OAuth protocol, uh, you can deploy new grant types. So there are like built-in ones like authorization codes, refresh token, client credentials, Token exchange, you can you can now deploy your own ones like extension grants. For token exchange, you can deploy a token exchange profiles like plugins. So the it is a project of like utter uh, extensibility. Uh, and uh, this is exactly what I did. So I implemented the draft of the standard as a plugin for Keyclock. It just took two classes and like 300 lines of code. It is a limit. It is a proof of concept. It's, of course, it's not production ready. It has limitations. It's a very small jar. So currently, it implements only the basic flow, only the acquisition of a transaction token. And uh, in Keyclock, there would normally be like multiple definitions of uh, like ex external auth uh, authorization services, like trusted parties. So in this implementation, it's limited to a single one that's configured by environment variables. Um, so the demo appliance, it uh, almost mirrors one of the initial slides. We have uh, five containers here. Uh, the edge is, almost everything is implemented using Quarkus and Java. Key, key clock is also based on Quarkus. In, in, the, in the past, it used to run on top of Wildfly. It was really heavyweight. And the startup, it took like 25 seconds, maybe on a typical box. And now we have migrated to Quarkus, maybe a couple of years now. It became, became 
way more lightweight. So all the startup, it takes maybe five seconds, five to nine seconds. The footprint has decreased uh, significantly. And uh, we are now joining the CNCF Cloud Native Computer Foundation. So Keycloak is becoming more and more cloud, cloud friendly and cloud native. So the demo appliance, I'm sorry, need to decrease font. The demo appliance is built with Docker Compose. It's just a set of, of, of separate containers. There is a container itself, there is Edge, and initialization container that are already exited. A authorization server, like it emu emulates the external one. Transaction token services, the key clock with a plugin. And two services, actually those are the instances of the same container, but with different configuration. And one service calling another. Uh, I think it's going to be the quickest and probably the simplest demos ever. Uh, I'm sorry for the font size. So this was a, like a, a pretty simple front end built with Vue.js with one single button. Uh, sec uh, secured by uh, like adapter that redirects us to key clock. Now we're performing authentication. We are authenticated. And now I need to bring another window. And let it remain on top. So when I click the button, a little happens on the front end, yeah, just successful call, and quite a lot happens uh, uh, under the hood. So first, the request was received by the edge. Now, then it initiated obtaining a transaction token. The request for transaction token was received by key clock, by TTS. Requ the token exchange was successful. The edge received the transaction token and then passed it down to the services. And one service called another. So, and here we can see the contents of the transaction token. So, basically, that's it. So, you can find you can find the code, the code on GitHub. Everything's published. So if you're interested in just trying out uh, just transaction token service, you need to follow the first link. It's a plugin for Keycloak. And the, the second link, is, uh, it refers to the, the whole demo appliance. Okay. Now, the next steps. Uh, what's different about uh, transaction token service and the traditional authorization server? Uh, it turns out that the, when it comes to scaling, like to deploying multiple instances of transaction token service, it turns out that it can be, the, the instances could be stateless and they could share like virtually no data at all between the instances. This is not the case be, uh, for the auth classical authorization server because there are sessions, there is state you need to maintain. So this is a typical deployment of Keycloak as authorization service. There is InfiniSpan caches that talk to, to each other and there is a shared database or a database cluster. For uh, transaction tokens, we can leave in Finispan just as a local cache. We can use uh, a built in like embedded database like H2, for example. And the only, only thing that needs to be shared between, shared between the instances is just the key set, because you do not want your instances to sign transaction tokens using different keys. So by default, Key Clock will generate its key key pair and store it in the database, but this can be configured so and needs to be configured. The instance used the, the external key store, but you will need to main, maintain this key store yourself, like rotating keys. Uh, next step, going native. Uh, probably you've heard about Graal VM and the ability to compile Java programs into binaries. Uh, so unfortunately, key clock, it's, it's, a, it's a huge project. I, yeah, it could, could sound like controversial. It's lightweight, but it's huge. The code base is really huge. It's, it's a complex project. But still, the native version does exist. Uh, unfortunately, as a very early experiment by the author of Keycloak, Stian Thorgerson, but it is working. 
And startup time, it's less, so in some cases, it's under half a second compared to, like, to 10 seconds for, J for JVM. And also, the, the memory usage is reduced drastically. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately, it's, as I mentioned, it's not production ready. So it has a lot of issues that needs to be solved. Uh, but uh, it's, it's the way to go, I think. So one day we will have a like, production ready uh, native build of Keycloak. So currently it's an experiment. It doesn't contain like, all the unnecessary things like LDAP, uh, like Liquibase, but that's enough for transaction token service. Uh, and it is. it turns out that it's too early to write off the concept of access token propagation that I mentioned earlier in the beginning of the talk. Uh, it turns out that uh, the mechanisms that already exist for, for token propagation, they could be retrofitted for transaction tokens. Uh, let's take the implementation in Quarkus. So it does support, like it, it can take incoming access token as a bearer authentication, and it can propagate it automatically. So for all the outgoing calls that you do via like, REST client, it will append, it, it will append them as an authorization bearer header, and also in Quarkus or IDC client, it can also it can also do a token exchange for you. But unfortunately, it is also very limited. It will propagate this token only as an authorization bearer scheme, which needs to, as you remember, which needs to change to TXN token header. Um, but I think it, it should be easy to implement. And as you remember, uh, when doing a token exchange to, to obtain transaction token, you need some, sometimes you need to pass uh, a data that describes your call, it's contextual data. This is currently also not supported with uh, OIDC client, but uh, we're working on it. The roadmap is to uh, implement token tr transaction token service specification completely. That means two missing flows, replacement token flow and S2S flow. Uh, in, there will be an interesting issue. So the spec mentions that you can include the identity of the calling workload. So the only reliable way for the transaction token service to retrieve or to compute that uh, identity of the workload is to use like underlying mechanism like Spiffy. So, and it's, it's, it, it's going to be challenging and interesting uh, how to obtain that workload ID. And uh, Finally, when it's, <coughs> sorry. Uh, when it's in a more or less finalized form, I'm planning to contribute it to Keycloak for it to, to be included in the upstream. Uh, for Minicloak, uh, so currently all the tests are turned off when you're doing a na native build. So we can gradually turn them on. So just to ensure that the minimal subset that is needed for transaction token service, that it is properly tested, covered by tests. And, uh, I think it's worth doing proper benchmarking because I only have like minimal comparison with uh, like startup times, memory usage. Uh, it will be interesting to look at the performance difference. And uh, as I mentioned, we can retrofit uh, key, uh, Quarkus or IDC clients to support this upcoming spec, which will involve like doing two issues. And that's it. So any questions? I guess no, then thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And now we can go to the pub. <laughs> <laughs>